Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Wednesday, May 16th, 2018. Your humble host took a few days off. We spent Mother's Day weekend in New York City with our son David. And due to a thunderstorm, our flight out of JFK was delayed by three hours last night. Which means I got to sleep about 3 in the morning. And uh, so if I'm a little bit uh, lightheaded today, I hope you will understand. I come to you with uh, news that has broken over the last few days. And disturbing news. And even more disturbing because of the complicity of Democrats, who are supposed to be part of the so-called Trump resistance. And the first item is that today the Senate Intelligence Committee voted 10 to 5, to approve the confirmation of Gina Haspel, the proven torturess, as the next director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And two Democrats smoothed the way. Mark Warner, the senior Democrat on the committee, and Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota. And together with people like Joe Manchin and Bill Nelson of Florida, the Democrats are making sure that Trump's pick to run the CIA at this really crucial time, is going to be confirmed. And while it appeared, uh, you know, at certain stages here that John McCain's opposition, Rand Paul's opposition, and the announcement from people like Dianne Feinstein that they would not be voting for Gina Haspel, it looked like the Democrats might hang together and reject this deeply flawed nomination. But their complicity here together with the next story that I'll cover in some depth, indicates to me that the Democrats are a sorry bunch of losers. These are people who don't understand the values that you and I share. And I believe that if you listen to this podcast on a regular basis, you're somewhat aligned with my point of view. I don't expect you to agree with me on everything. But those of us who believe that torture is unconscionable, should never be allowed, should never be endorsed or practiced by the United States, and that the dark days under the Bush administration are a deep stain on American history, that's all being pushed aside. Because Gina Haspel wrote a letter to Mark Warner and said that she wouldn't torture in the future, and with the benefit of hindsight and my experience as a senior agency leader, the enhanced interrogation program is not one the CIA should have undertaken. So she expresses a little bit of regret. And, of course, she and all of her colleagues and the political appointees of the Bush administration who supported the torture regime, they've all gotten away with it. And, sure, John Brennan was confirmed by Democrats under Obama, and he was part of the torture team, but he didn't go to Thailand to the black site. He didn't get personally involved the way she did. And we know that there was one critical document that was pulled from access by senators just over the last couple of days. And so this is not in any way a fair or transparent process. We don't even know this woman's history. It is shrouded in secrecy. And I consider that to be fundamentally un-American. Heidi Heitkamp, barely a Democrat from North Dakota, she said, well, it hadn't been an easy decision, but Gina Haspel is well respect respected by the agency's rank and file. It's clear she has the experience and temperament to be an effective CIA director. And it's this kind of rationalization, this kind of get-along, go-along, this failure to really draw a firm line and say, you know, <laughs> we just don't go below this standard. This is why the Democrats are largely indistinguishable from the Republican Trumpists. And it's why I fear that the Democrats really will not fare well in the midterm elections this November. That blue wave that so many people have been dreaming about? Well, I think the Democrats are busy pissing it away. And as we look at the massacre 
of 60 Palestinians along the Gaza border with Israel on Monday. On the eve of the 70th, you can't call it an anniversary, the 70-year mark of the Nakba. And yesterday, before we left New York, we had a chance to have a great seafood late lunch with our Palestinian friends, Hala and Samir Araj. Hala's mother is still alive. She's in her mid-80s. I met her a few years ago, and she opened her purse and pulled out a special little uh, container. And she said, these are the keys to our home in Palestine. And Hala's mother was a teenager when her family was rousted and booted off their historic lands to make way for the influx of Jews to form the state of Israel. And they still cling to a right of return. But that right, R-I-G-H-T, has become a right, R-I-T-E, of suppression, imprisonment, and occasional slaughter at the hands of the Israelis who occupy the historic lands of the Palestinians. More than 2,700 people were injured by the Israeli gunfire. An eight-month-old baby girl who had breathed in tear gas was the 60th fatality. And virtually all the others were killed by Israeli snipers. The only nation really standing up and calling this a vile massacre is Turkey. (laughs) And that shows how low we have sunk. Turkey's maximum leader, Erdogan, very comfortable slaughtering Kurds in his own country or in neighboring Syria. But even he draws the line at the obvious disproportionate response. Not a single Israeli was injured or killed in the six weeks of protests that have been occurring. And, of course, Israel blames Hamas, and most countries join Israel in blaming the victims here, and not those who assaulted them. And Trump's U.N. Ambassador, Nikki Haley, who had no foreign policy experience before being appointed to this job, she stopped out of a Security Council session as a representative of the Palestinians began to speak. And in blocking an effort at the U.N. Security Council to launch an investigation into this slaughter, Nikki Haley said, who among us would accept this type of activity on your border? No one would. No country in this chamber would act with more restraint than Israel has. I I mean, this is so obscene. It is absurd. It is Orwellian. And this follows the uh, celebration, the events in Jerusalem where Trump sent his daughter Ivanka and son-in-law Jared Kushner, who are deep apologists for the illegal settlements. They were there to celebrate this great day of moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. That is only one of the factors that has sparked the recent protests and the killing of Palestinians. Now, despite the U.S. block at the Security Council, the top human rights group at the United Nations will hold a special session to discuss the deteriorating situation in the occupied Palestinian territories. And the statement released said that any new alleged crime committed in the context of the situation in Palestine may be subjected to the office's legal scrutiny. Now, there is some dispute about the role of Hamas in these protests. Many of the Palestinians say, no, these are organic, this is coming from the people, and Hamas members have participated. But to cloud the issue a bit, Israel claimed that about a dozen of the people they killed were Hamas members. But today, a senior Hamas official, Salah Bardawal, uh, that's Bardawil, claimed that 50 of the 60 who died are members of Hamas. 
But that is not the point. Because the Palestinians at most were armed with things that they can throw, rocks, bottles, maybe a Molotov cocktail. The Israelis are extremely well uh, uh, defended. And when you see these little kites that may have a small Molotov cocktail or some other uh, weapon, I have to put that in air quotes, you see how desperate the Palestinians are to make any kind of a statement to fight back against the oppression. And Shane Smith, who is the founder of Vice News, and he loves to do these softball interviews with heads of state. I, I remember watching an Obama interview he did a couple of years ago, and <laughs> he's not a journalist. Maybe he was, but uh, he doesn't play one when he uh, hosts these things on his own network. So he met with Benjamin Netanyahu. Netanyahu showed off parts of an Iranian drone that was shot down over the Golan Heights before a missile volley that was blamed on Iran. But he also lectured the Palestinians. It's time to tell the Palestinians, abandon your fantasy of destroying Israel. Abandon the fantasy that says Israel will disappear. It will not. And so he is emboldened. This is a guy who is deeply corrupt, being investigated on four very serious cases of corruption by Israeli authorities. He was elected with less than 20% of the popular vote in his most recent election in Israel. And so he clings to power by riding the wave that he has created by manipulating Trump into exiting the Iran deal, building tensions with Iran, preparing for a war, and he hopes that that will allow him to maintain his grip on power for some foreseeable future. And here in the United States, the apologists for the Netanyahu government, the bloodthirsty Zionist extremists who control Israel today, they get a lot of support. And you'd expect it from Trump, from the Republicans. But the Democrats claim that they're the <laughs> resistance, right? And they didn't put up enough resistance to Gina Haspel. They could have clobbered that nomination if they wanted to. And yesterday in New York, one of the tabloids had a headline of a picture of Ivanka and Jared there. And uh, the headline read, Daddy's Little Ghoul, referring to Ivanka. But here in the United States, we've got people like the number two Democrat in the House, Maryland Representative Steny Hoyer, defending Israel's violence. Gosh, he says, Israel's in a tough situation. It's trying to defend its borders. They're not real borders. They stole the land, and they erected barriers, and they claim that they have the right to defend that border. Hoyer went on, all the world would hope that it would be done in a peaceful manner, but when you have a terrorist organization in front of you that is historically and continuing to use violence, that makes it very tough. But it's important to note that despite the citation of militants by Steny Hoyer, it was civilian protesters, unarmed people, who were targeted with 60 who were killed. And the movement's organizers dispute the claim of Hamas organizing it. The Israeli government's allegations that Hamas organized these protests are lies and are defamatory statements that have no basis in reality. But that doesn't stop the U.S. officials from echoing the statements of the Israeli government and essentially blaming the victims. And Steny Hoyer went out of his way to say that he supports moving the capital and the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. He said he supported that for 20 years. So does Chuck Schumer, top Democrat in the U.S. Senate. And if you really track it down, most Democrats and Republicans 
support Trump on this move. They know it's unpopular in this country, but now it's a fait accompli. You're seeing the Democrats come out and say, me too, oh yeah, I think that's great. And let's name the handful of Democrats who have made statements at least opposing to the disproportionate use of force. In the Senate, it's Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And their comments are not full-throated. In the House, Mark Pocan of Wisconsin, Pramila Jayapal of Washington, Keith Ellison of Minnesota, Hank Johnson of Georgia, and Raul Grijalva of Arizona. These five issued a statement. We are shocked and dismayed by the lethal force used by Israeli troops against mostly unarmed protesters demonstrating at Gaza's border, which has led to the deaths at that time of more than 50 Palestinians and the wounding of over 2,000 people in one day alone. We commend Israeli human rights groups and civil society leaders who are urging Israeli troops to refuse to comply with unlawful open-fire orders. Unarmed demonstrators breaching a fence is not an imminent threat to life, which is the only legal justification for the use of lethal force. Trump's provocative decision to relocate the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem appears to have emboldened Israeli reactions to demonstrators, culminating in some of the highest levels of violence experienced in the area in weeks. This is the strongest statement that you can find in the U.S. officialdom. And it's not that strong. Oh, and let me add uh, Senator Pat Leahy of Vermont. He has asked the State Department to evaluate its aid to Israel and determine if it should prohibit military support to certain units. How about suspending the entire $3.5 billion a year military gift to Israel that the United States increased under Barack Obama without negotiating anything in return. So we had some protests. A couple of hundred people went to the Israeli consulate in San Francisco yesterday and made their statements. We're also seeing some progressive Jewish organizations speak out, including, uh, let's see, uh, if not now, Jewish Voice for Peace, J Street, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, and others. Jewish Voice for Peace uh, representative Rebecca Vilkemersen blasted the juxtaposition of the celebratory U.S. Embassy opening and the killing of the Palestinians. Monday, I thought, was one of the most disgraceful days in the history of the Israeli relationship to Palestinians with the celebration of annexation, even as Palestinians, the vast majority of whom are refugees, were being gunned down just for protesting their basic rights to live in dignity and freedom. The idea that this is being done in our name or being justified in our name is absolutely unacceptable. And look critically at the corporate media you watch or read here in the United States. Because they sanitize. They use the passive voice. And writing at The Guardian today, Mustafa Bayoumi, an American, says, you know, judging by some of these reports, it's almost as if bullets just hang in the air waiting for Palestinians to walk deliberately into them. And today, as I was driving to the studio... I heard a news report on CBS radio that Guatemala has joined the United States in moving its embassy to Jerusalem. We heard a soundbite from Netanyahu with absolutely no mention of the Palestinian killings. And Bayoumi goes on to say in, in criticizing some of the reports, the New York Times sent out a tweet about the bloody events, dozens of Palestinians have died in protests as the U.S. prepares to open its Jerusalem embassy. Bayoumi is uh, flummoxed. He says, have died? Really? We should note how the passive voice in this tweet hides the one performing the action, which is exactly what passive voice constructions can do. In this tweet, Israel is assigned no responsibility for killing protesters. They just appear to have mysteriously have died. Now, after some criticism, it appears the New York Times changed a headline in the print edition because it read, Israel, Israelis killed dozens in Gaza. But Bayoumi says, which Israelis? 
Wouldn't Israel be a more accurate noun? The military represents the state, not individual citizens. Over at the Washington Post, he cites a headline. It's a long one. Gaza buries its dead as death toll from the protests at fence with Israel rises to at least 60. Again, the headline leaves us wondering who killed the people of Gaza. Are we to assume that the protests and not the Israeli military killed these people? Wall Street Journal. Headline, clashes over new U.S. embassy in Jerusalem leave dozens dead. Frankly, this headline is even worse than the others. To label the massacre as clashes is not only disingenuous but grossly misleading because it sounds like the Palestinians were only protesting the new U.S. embassy location. And Joe Lauria, now the editor at ConsortiumNews.com, published a piece under the headline, U.S. Media Whitewashes Gaza Massacre. And he offers similar criticisms. A CNN headline, Dozens Die in Gaza. And he quotes our friend Max Blumenthal responding, Maybe they were old. Perhaps they were sick. They just up and died. Who will solve the mystery behind these deaths? And he goes on to uh, note, Joe Laria does, the projection. Deflecting blame from Israel is one thing, but projecting it onto the victim is quite another. Israel's U.N. Ambassador Danny Dannon on Monday called for the Security Council to condemn Hamas for their war crimes because every casualty on the border is a direct victim of Hamas. And a statement uh, written by Dannon, he's uh, Israel's uh, U.N. Ambassador, concludes, every casualty on the border is a victim of Hamas war crimes. Every death is a result of Hamas terror activity. And these casualties are solely Hamas responsibility. As if those IDF snipers are actually members of Hamas who just enjoy killing their brothers and sisters in Gaza. I, I mean, it's just bizarre. And it allows many Americans to just shrug their shoulders and say, well, you know, well. And here's a quote from Chuck Schumer. Every nation should have the right to choose its capital. I sponsored legislation to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem two decades ago, and I applaud President Trump for doing it. So much for the resistance. Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the PBC Podcast with your subscriptions. Margaret Anderson and Janet Price, they are staunch supporters, kicking in 10 bucks a month. Joey Perillo, Wendy Gebauer, they're $5 a month supporters. You can do it too if you've got the cash. I don't want your Social Security money. And George, uh, we won't uh, embarrass him, but he's got some cash flow problems, and he notified me he's going to suspend his subscription for a while. George, you'll be getting a note from me about your new scholarship to the Peter B. Collins podcast. But I invite you, if you've got a little extra spending money, to send a few bucks my way. Just visit peterbcollins.com, click on the menu tab, pull it down, click on become a subscriber, and you land on the sign-up page where I think you'll know what to do. And if you're allergic to PayPal, you can drop a note and a contribution in the mail. My mailing address is box 15660, San Rafael, California, 94915. It's getting a little confusing in the last 24 hours. North Korea notified South Korea that it is suspending their bilateral talks and that North Korea may cancel the Trump-Kim Jong-un summit now set for June, June 12th, in Singapore. And this is a result of the heavy-handed war games that the U.S. is conducting uh, in the area of South Korea. Now, there were mixed signals because Kim kind of said he understood about the war games and it's okay, but apparently we overplayed our hand, and we also uh, brought in all kinds of heavy aircraft that apparently have spooked the North Koreans. And the other issue is between the good cop of Mike Pompeo and the bad cop of John Bolton. Because Bolton is saying that the model for North Korea's disarmament, nuclear disarmament, should be Libya. And after what happened to Muammar Gaddafi, you can imagine Kim Jong-un is a little queasy. And the issue here is 
whether Trump thinks that at the June 12th meeting, he can get North Korea to unilaterally disarm. Kim has made it clear that he sees a process here, and as North Korea moves forward with what he calls denuclearization, the response should be relaxation of sanctions, economic incentives, etc. Now, this could just be a bump in the road between two bullies and bluffers, but it also could spell a serious problem for these talks going forward. Well, we have an identification by the FBI of the man they accuse of being responsible for the theft of the Vault Seven hacking tools from the CIA over a year ago. A 29-year-old former CIA software engineer and hacker named Joshua Schulte, who now lives in New York and was working for a different company for Bloomberg, well, he's been accused of this, but they haven't filed charges against him. Instead, they are charging him with a nine-year-old case of running a server that contained some child pornography. It's not clear that the kitty porn was his. It's not clear at all why they are unwilling to charge him, but they will publicly state that they consider him to be the responsible party. We'll see how that one plays out. Trump had to make a tough decision. He filed a financial disclosure statement on deadline today, and revealed for the first time that he paid more than a hundred thousand dollars to Michael Cohen to reimburse him for the Stormy Daniels hush money contract. Now this creates a problem for Trump because he didn't report this last year, and he clearly should have. The other option, though, was to head over into. Uh, the murky area of campaign contributions that would have been an even bigger problem for Trump. Now the White House maintains that he voluntarily reported this in the interest of transparency, but the Government Ethics Office's director said that the uh, rules are clear that the payment made by Cohen is required to be reported by Trump as a liability. So perhaps to distract us from the vote on torturous Gina Haspel's CIA confirmation, the Senate Intelligence Committee did a big document dump today, records of some of the interviews that they've done with Donnie Trump Jr. and many other people linked to the narrative of Trump-Russia collusion. Well, these were released, and the intelligence community claims. That this is in accordance. It, it affirms the reports that came from the intelligence community in October of 2016 and then in January of 2017. But the evidence doesn't really align with the vague statements and the assertions that were made in those two intelligence documents、uh, prior. Now they haven't written their report, and so a lot of this is being done by inference. But today, they were huddling behind closed doors with the people who I consider to be the architects of the Trump-Russia narrative: former Director of National Intelligence James R. Clapper, the proven perjurer, and former CIA Director John Brennan, who we referred to a little bit earlier. Now, this account I'm looking at says the documents generally support the idea that the that no damaging information. On the Clinton campaign was actually shared at that infamous meeting in June of 2016 at Trump Tower with a number of Russians. Rob Goldstone, the music industry publicist who helped arrange the meeting, well, when he when he left, he apologized to Don Jr., saying that this was a big mistake. Then a Trump attorney, not Michael Cohen, a guy named Alan Futterfoss. Sent out a statement to Goldstone, saying, "Hey, here's the、uh, sheet music. Sing this song." And Goldstone said it was ludicrous. It seemed like something I would never write. It didn't sound like my voice. It sounded like an across-the-board、uh, endorsement of Don Jr. as opposed to stating facts. So, the admission from the documents published today is that no dirt on Hillary Clinton was coughed up at this meeting. The Russians wanted to lobby to get the Trumpers to agree to repeal the Magnitsky Act. 
which had put sanctions on a number of Russians. And then there's the question of whether Don Jr. knows that when he calls Daddy, that Daddy's home phone number has a blocked caller ID, because there are two calls that he made before and after talking to his Russian contact uh, to a blocked number. I mean, that's as good as they got. I mean, the bottom line here is that the, while Trump did write a misleading statement about his kids meeting with the Russians, it appears that there wasn't much that came out of the meeting. And this is another case where the cover-up appears to be much worse than whatever it is they were covering up. Meanwhile, the New York Times today ran a lengthy story. When I printed it out, it's 21 pages. It's headlined, A Secret Mission, A Code Name and Anxiety, Inside the Early Days of the FBI's Trump Investigation. Now, I'll link to this mega report for you, and it advances the story a little bit. The FBI code name for the investigation of the Trump campaign, Crossfire Hurricane, stolen from a Rolling Stone song. But let me just jump to the, the, the page uh, 19 of this 21-page epic. Quote, a year and a half later, no public evidence has surfaced connecting Trump's advisors to the hacking or linking Trump himself to the Russian government's disruptive efforts. But the headline that the Times wrote just before the election which uh, it quotes itself, investigating Donald Trump, FBI sees, sees no clear link to Russia, gave an air of finality to an investigation that was just beginning. So you can read this for yourselves. Uh, it does add some new details to the investigation. But it doesn't find anything that rises to the level of the hysterical coverage that the Times and other outlets have been giving us for coming up on two years now. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You'll find it on YouTube. I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you Keep smiling